Uh, welcome to the last presentation of this morning's uh, risk assessment and emergency response session. Um, just a couple of reminders, uh, Geneva is in the back. If you have any CEUs, please drop her your sheet and she'll have it ready for you at the end of the session. Uh, if you have any cell phones, please make sure you silence them. And really that's it, let's have some fun. So uh, I've got the pleasure to welcome to the stage, Michael Harry and Christine Kelly. Uh, Michael, he worked in the US Navy as a nuclear field electrician's mate from 2013 to 2016. He then attended the University of or Oregon, earning a BS in spatial data science and technology in 2020. In the fall of 2020, he joined the Oregon State University as a faculty research assistant in the School of Chemical, Biological, and Environmental Engineering. He's the fieldwork coordinator and GIS analyst leading wastewater collection efforts on the OSU campus and in selected cities around Oregon. And Christine, she's a professor in the Chemical, Biological, and Environmental Engineering at Oregon State University. In the last few years, she has co-led uh, wastewater surveillance program to measure COVID-19 viral concent concentrations in over 40 cities in Oregon. Uh, the pro program has expanded to include other pathogens, including influenza. Uh, she teaches in the bioengineering program and has been active in engineering education research. So please uh, join me in welcoming them to the stage. Hi, thank you so much. To today in this session, we're gonna talk about wastewater surveillance as an emergency response to an infectious disease outbreak, which is pretty much what we've been doing. Although we've had a kind of a statewide program that hasn't been so much as a response, but as a planned event. But I'm gonna to talk today about our, our short-term uh, analysis or responses to certain things that we see. So first I'll talk about a little bit about wastewater surveillance, the methods we use. Michael will talk about the micro sewer shed process, which is what we call when we go into a community and look at the community and its parts, not as a whole. And uh, we'll talk some selected results of some work we've done just to illustrate the type of data that we can get from an emergency response to, to a, a disease outbreak. Um, so first of all, wastewater surveillance, right? Uh, we essentially measure the concentration of, in this case, pathogens in the wastewater, right? And this data can be used by public health officials to um, do a lot of things, make decisions about control and promotion of public health. It's very timely. We, we can measure it and get it, get it turned around pretty quick. It's representative of the whole, of the whole population within the collection boundary. Um, of, of the sewer system. Of course, we do miss people with on-site systems. It can be quite sensitive. We, we did some work, and I'm not gonna talk about it today, where we measured 20 different um, wastewater from 20 different manholes on the OSU campus twice a week for two years. And we essentially could find a single person in a dorm who had COVID-19. Um, and of course, it's very specific to the disease that we're looking for. So we believe wastewater surveillance can be a component of a robust public health strategy. However, right, this COVID-19 pandemic did engender the use of really across the world of wastewater surveillance. It's not a new thing, but it wasn't implemented so systematically until now. And so uh, we are providing real time and very important information to public health practitioners but maybe at early on, it's more important the public health practitioners are learning how to use this data, what it means, how reliable, what, what its variability is. So it is kind of a, a, we've got two cultures, wastewater treatment culture and a public health culture and trying to get them to work together. So we're introducing a new surveillance method in Oregon, of course, this is happening around the country and really help them to characterize the meaning and variability of wastewater surveillance results, establish protocols so we can enhance its usefulness over time. I think this is not going away. Um, the CDC uh, has a whole area working on this. They're funding all the states to do this. Wastewater surveillance is, I think, here to stay. I think there's a huge, personally, I think there's a huge elephant in the room that maybe the CDC is not, not paying attention to and that every single sample that I get, and I've gotten thousands of samples, has been a volunteer, like has been 
given to be volunteer of the wastewater treatment facility, right? There's nothing that's saying that they have to do that. And that's, that's kind of um, like something to rely on uh, for a big program is just volunteer participation. We've got to kind of think about that. Um, so the advantage of wastewater, right? It's unbiased, right? Whoever uses the facilities in the collection boundary contributes to the signal, right? We can look at various scales, right? It's very economic because you can remember when we're testing individual people here, we can monitor really an entire city with one sample, right? So it's very inexpensive. We definitely monitor trends and correlate with prevalence. Um, we can go into a community, not just measure at the influent to the plant to get the whole community, but we can go into the community and separate it into regions. Um, we also, in addition to getting the concentration of the virus in the wastewater, we also sequence all of the positive samples so we can get the variant information also in a city with a single sample. And really, there's no sampling bias in that, you know, if there's certain cities that are like testing not available, or the culture is not of testing. And of course, now with we have at home testing that information of who's positive, who's negative doesn't get to our public health authorities. Um, right? People aren't getting tired of doing tests because uh, they just naturally contribute. <laughs> so to talk about the methods, um, just real quick, I'll talk about it. So we do sample collection and all of our samples are 24 hour composites. Um, we, for our statewide program, we sample at the influent to wastewater treatment facilities. But in what we're gonna talk about today, we um, sample in manholes. Um, uh, we concentrate through uh, filtration. We then homogenize that sample. We do automated RNA purification and digital droplet RT-PCR um, to in the analyze for whatever, whatever pathogen we're looking for. So it's specific to that pathogen. We know what we're looking for. But then we also sequence for that the variants of that pathogen. And then we report to the authorities. And OHA has a dashboard where they put all of our Oregon data on. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Michael now, and he's going to talk about the process of uh, sampling our micro sewer sheds, which is what the emergency response is. So what we do when we want to sample a micro sewer shed, we want to break down a city um, into a, a smaller scale. We've been monitoring cities themselves for some time, but we want to go in and actually break down the neighborhoods and figure out how is a virus or, or disease moving through a community at a time. So we'll, we'll separate it down into neighborhoods to be sampled at manholes. We'll pick specific manholes that represent the, man, the neighborhood the, uh, service areas. So each neighborhood is, is called a micro sewer shed. So when we say a micro sewer shed, that's an individual neighborhood within a city. And we can do this on the short term or we can do it long term. We can just go in one time or we can continue for, for weeks at a time and continue monitoring. And, and see it as it moves. <clears throat> so here, this is the, the process we've developed because um, we've done a lot of these so far. Um, so let's let's say someone calls us up and the community says that they're, they're swimming in COVID or they have flu coming out their ears. What's our response? This is, this is how we start going about that. And this could be done um, at the city. So wait, if you call me up this day, I could I could load up a truck and go to your city and we could begin this process or it can be done over emails or phone calls, phone tag, that kind of stuff over a couple of weeks, How, um, whatever the urgency is. We'll begin with just agreeing with the partners. What is the scope, the goals of the surveillance, the partners being the community, um, whoever's funding, whether it's OHA or, or OSU and and the workers are, are the, the partners and then the goals. What are we trying to capture? What what um, time frame are we looking at? And then we'll go into the city, we'll select the number of sites that would give us our, our goal. And we'll also talk about how often we wanna go back, the sampling frequency, how often are we gonna sample all these sites to achieve that goal? Um, we have to consider the time because if we do 16 man, uh, manholes, it's gonna take a lot more time to just deploy and collect. We have to consider our budget. Um, every sample costs money. And then also um, how do we get adequate spatial coverage with the amount of points that we can put on there. So we consider all those, determine the number of sites, 
and how often we want to go back. And then next, we'll we'll look at the sewer maps and the street maps. Um, this is really my, my strong point. I've analyzed over 40 different cities collection systems. And we just go through those and pick pick the pinch points, the, the main points where we can get the spatial um, coverage we need or any um, points of interest. We'll pick those points off of the sewer map, figure out which manholes work or a pump station even. And actually a city worker is, is really helpful helping us who is more familiar with the map. And so we'll go through and we'll pick exactly where we want to put these things. And once we pick those, um, we've selected the, the, the potential sites and then we're gonna go out and we're gonna actually look at them because some sites look really great on paper, but we get out to the manhole and they're, if they're more than 30 feet deep, the little peristaltic pump in our samplers will not pull from them. Or if, if the pitch is such that it's like a water slide, it, it can be an issue if we can't get to the site, there's bushes covering it. I've had to hack away blackberry bushes to get to it, that can be an issue. And also if it's in the middle of a road, we don't wanna do that. It, it's just a, a big safety concern and, and we don't wanna to have to get an ODOT permission to go into these. So if it's not good, we'll pick another one either further up or down the main the sewer line. And then we'll identify what are the local practices, the policies we have to deal with. Um, some cities require us to be with the city worker at all times. Um, some cities have said, well, this is in the grass. Um, there's, there's no traffic control needed. So go ahead and, and come and go as you please. We'll, we'll decide with the city, the community, what they want us to do and then make sure that our safety practices are, are um, up to code. And then we'll, we'll just pick the, uh, the unique sample site identifiers. And I typically just like to know what's the nearest cross street because we have to label these things when they get back to the lab. So I know exactly where to put them on a map. If I have a sample go back to the lab that's not labeled, once I get my analysis, I won't know where to put it. So we pick out the unique, unique identifier before we even send um, collect these and, and we'll then label all the bottles before we come out, we'll label the bottles with that unique identifier. And then, once we've done all of that planning, okay, we've sharpened our ax for like eight hours, we can deploy the samplers. We can actually stick them in the manhole. And um, we have some really nice brackets that our machine shop made for us that we will we'll readjust depending on the size. And then we'll um, do a sampling. We'll do a 24 hour composite sampling. We load it up with ice and a fresh battery. We have to keep the samples cooled as they're pulled in. And then also once we bring them in, I'm gonna keep them on ice until I get them to the lab. And then, once they've ran for 24 hours, we come in to collect them. The next thing we have to do is we have to document how much we actually collected or if there are any failures. Um, if, we, if we only got about a tenth of a gallon, that's, that's a clue that we might not have had a very good composite sample and that has to be recorded. And if we had a clogging, potentially some sites are, are repeat clogging issues. So we record that and we know, okay, we need to either move this for the next time or I need to put some kind of strainer on there to stop that. And then once we've completely collected and we've recorded everything, the next thing we gotta do is to get it to the lab immediately. We don't um, sit around and, and wait for it to warm up. We keep it on ice, immediately get it to the, the lab in the, the refrigerator lab. And then students that day will come in and filter it and get it sent for analysis. The last thing we do is, is after we've analyzed it and we've, we've looked at all the results, we'll communicate those results to the community and all of the partners involved so that everyone knows exactly what we found. So that's kind of our process that we could deploy upon uh, an em emergency situation where there's a disease and we want some more data around it. This is the examples that we have done, um, the different cities there, and they kind of show from April 2020 all the way through. Most recently in August, we did the World Athletic Championship in Eugene. Um, and so we're going to just talk about some of these examples to show you what kind of data we get from these, what we call micro sewer shed studies. Um, so if we, if we kind of, some of these were truly kind of uh, um, emergency situations. There's in the very first kind of one was Newport, had a big outbreak way early summer 2020, that outbreak at a food processing facility and the state act and the county actually asked to go in and see what was going on there. Another one um, 
Hermiston also had a big outbreak and that was all later in the summer of 2020. And we were asked to go in there. Actually, the, the governor asked us to go in there and do that. And so some of these were really actual emergency response. Other ones were, were just kind of more, we're looking to see what's going on. Why is this one different than another? And then the 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 World Athletic Championship, which is, is similar. It was a, a a specific event in time that we went in before and after and during to try to see what was going on. We had a lot of people coming in, 100,000 people coming in from out of state, see if that kind of affected what was going on. So just to show some examples, some of you have probably already seen these Newport results. They've been um, talked about quite a bit. <laughs> um, so this is the plot of Newport micro sewer sheds. I think there was like 16 micro sewer sheds. And we did that in, in conjunction with TRACE. And TRACE um, was the organization, and they did this early in the pandemic where they would go to a city, go to like 600 homes in that city and say, would you like to volunteer to take a test? And this was before testing was widely available. And so it was a way to get the true prevalence because volunteer to take a test, whether you have symptoms or not, the true prevalence in a city. And at, I like to say they did above ground, we did below ground um, with, with uh, this trace uh, process to where, so we could do wastewater while they did um, true prevalence. Um, of course, there is some bias in that also, because some people might say, no, I don't want to take a I don't want to take a test, um, but it, but in addition, we, we just thought it was a good good way to look at our wastewater. So um, we did that several times. Um, I guess there was 22 different micro sewer sheds in Newport. Um, and the results there, we could correlate, we could show our wastewater results, we could show the prevalence results. We're also showing the OHA reported cases at this time. Remember, this is quite, like June 2020, it's quite early. If you look at this, um, this is early on. There's a 3.2% prevalence based on that volunteer random nasal sampling. And then if you look at the micro sewer sheds, they're in different colors based on the wastewater copy amount. So yellow is high and dark colored is low. And then the pink dots, right, are the the locations of people who have cases where they lived moved a little bit. So it's like not, can't tell who they are. Yeah. Okay, so so the, a, a gene copy, you know, is the RNA. And so um, a high level is, uh, well, 10 to the fifth, I, I usually think of these in a log. So, so that's not super high. I'll show you this. Um, the, the yellow is the high. So that's 10 to the fifth copies per liter. And that's pretty, pretty high. And 3.2 prevalence was fairly high at the time. Um, and then we went back several weeks later and the, the outbreak in the city had declined. And so you can see both the case numbers, which is the pink dots, went quite a bit down. Uh, the wastewater concentrations went quite a bit lower. The prevalence went from 3.2 to 0.6%. So all of those three measures of the disease state in the community um, correlated to each other as we, as we studied this quite early in the pandemic. Um, we did this many other places, Newport Corval, Spring, Springfield, Eugene, Redmond Bend, and Boardman Hermiston, although we just have the Hermiston results here. Um, and if we look at, um, like the, there's our Ben micro sewer shed, there's our Redmond micro sewer sheds. Hermiston at that time was very, very high. Um, and Eugene Springfield was quite high. And so that went up to, this is a different scale. It's the log gene copy and above 5.5 is pretty high. The max I've ever seen is seven. Um, and that was for a pretty, pretty concentrated sample. So if we look at those prevalences as measured by trace random sampling, you can see like we did the Newport twice, it was 3.4, then 0.6. If you look at Hermiston, it was 16.9 prevalence percent when we did that um, in July of 2020. So you can see we measured prevalence in those places and 
wastewater. And if you look at um, correlating that prevalence to wastewater with these early micro sewer shed studies that we did, um, the wastewater essentially log concentration is on the vertical and, or I'm sorry, on the, or on the horizontal. And the true prevalence is on the vertical, which is essentially the number of people with COVID per 10,000 people. And you can see this lines up quite well, even across time and different cities that we did in terms of a um, nice correlation between those. So we, we like to say that really wastewater is better than uh, case numbers. And you know, case numbers were being reported very, very early on, but now with that home test case numbers are, we know they're better. So wastewater is like one of the best data sources you can get of disease prevalence in a, in a community without measuring all the people individually. Um, so Michael's gonna talk about Redmond and Gramps. So these are some of the, the results that we've had so far. Um, one of the first ones we did, uh, Redmond in de uh, December of 2020 through January of 2021, we did uh, bend at the same time, but we went back to Redmond several times. And that was during the, the, first, um, the first vaccine doses arriving and people were starting to come out of the lockdown. So it was an interesting case to, to study. We saw a surge in COVID right around that time as people came out of their homes. And then we'll also look at Grants Pass, which was this uh, December, right when the Omicron variant was traveling across the nation. And, and we'll show you some of the results that we found. So we went back to the, the city of Redmond, Oregon five times, um, right when that was happening. And, and this is the first time we ever did a time series. We were able to go back several, several weeks and just see how it kind of moved through the community. So beginning the first week we went, uh, things were looking kind of moderately high, and then the next week, it looked like things might have been slowing down, but really, the third week, we saw a, a spike on the right side of the bottom left-hand map, and so what we saw was kind of like a wave of COVID moving through the community, and then as we went back a few weeks later, it had gone back down, so we, we, we saw almost a, cr a cresting wave going through from, from the left to the right in the community as people started coming out of their homes. And then fast forward about a year later, we were in Grants Pass um, about the same time of year, that, that heavy travel season, the, the holiday travel season. And what we found was one particular community had a spike, which is what we saw in Redmond um, previous, the, the year previously. Um, of note, that one site on the top left map in the top right corner of that map that's red is right along the I-5 corridor, lots of hotels and businesses, uh, restaurants. Um, and that's where we saw a very high level of COVID. Um, the next time we came out, it had spread to some of the outer, outer lying edges of the community, more of the residential community. And by the third time we had come out, everything was moderately high um, as far as COVID concentration, that SARS-CoV-2 virus we found. Um, I, I can speak firsthand. I, I actually caught COVID. I stayed in that red little spot. My hotel was right there. So. Three, three days, three or four days later, I had COVID. So pretty sure that's what happened there. And what we did, we, we this time we actually gene sequenced it, which is the first time we've been able to do that over time. And if you can see the, the top right map, the top right corner, that high spot actually had the highest amount of Omicron in the community the first time we saw uh, Omicron in Grants Pass. And then the, the next time we went out, it had spread to those outlying communities. It kind of followed the concentration of, of SARS-CoV-2. And then the last time we went out, the entire community was completely enveloped in uh, the Omicron variant as we gene sequenced it. So we actually saw a new variant come through, through town and mapped out the, the wave of that. And then more, most recently, we um, studied the World Athletic Championships in Eugene, Oregon. Um, we're still actually going through some of the results from this, but what we did, we tried to get ahead of an event and get a background of the community for a couple of weeks and then actually map out a major event where the population somewhat doubled in the town. And then we actually stuck around for almost a month afterwards to really just kind of see how things move through the community for this particular study. <clears throat> so this was in Eugene, Oregon, July, 2022, very recently. There was over 1700 track and field athletes 
as well as spectators, tourists coming in, trainers and volunteers. Uh, the city was expecting their, their population to double during this two week period. And just people from all over the world came. So potential for viruses from third world countries to even come into the city. So we picked out nine different sampling sites. Um, we, we didn't go for spatial coverage, but we, we just wanted to target the places where we thought we might see um, new viruses come into the community. And we actually, this is the first time we studied more than just COVID. We went for several different viruses. So we have SARS-CoV-2 listed, influenza, hepatitis, measles, MERS-CoV. We, we look for multiple viruses at this time. This is the first time we've actually been able to do a study with multiple diseases at once. So we picked out nine sample locations. I'll just go over why we picked them out. We did a, a pre-campus. So the main sewer line before it goes through the, the university campus, which is where the event was held. It's kind of the, the community before it, it reaches um, what's going on. And then we did two sites that were on the University of Oregon campus. One caught the dorms and another one caught mainly the stadium where uh, the event was held. We picked three different hotels um, just to see that might be where people are indoors. This was an outdoor event. That might be where people are interacting. We also picked the airport to see if we could catch someone coming in from another country to see if we could map that out. And then we picked um, one site downstream from the event. So as the sewer line reconnected with the community, we wanted to see if we could see an influence from the event in the main line. And then also we, we went to the treatment plant influent just to get an overall of the community during uh, this study. So as you can see, we, we got a lot of data. We've never had this many data points. The question was, how do we, how do we scale this between different diseases? So we're still working through all of those issues, but anything on this graph that is black was a positive for these diseases. That's what we've come up, we've, we've noticed the gray ones were, were a negative, but we did see plenty of positives in several different diseases. And just mapping out all these data points has been a, a struggle these weeks. But what we saw was that um, the, the upstream of campus did see a spike in, in at least COVID. So the surrounding community did see some, some spikes in there. There's three squares that are relatively higher during the actual event. The downstream of campus also looked somewhat higher and the influent was a little bit all over the map, but we can definitely see that outlying community being affected during the time of the event by COVID. And then we also, if, you, if we looked at influenza, we had the same trend. During the event, we saw a spike and after the event, it, it did somewhat go down, but a little bit higher. <clears throat> both um, this one definitely the downstream of the event was was much higher during the event so we saw a huge influence on possibly the signal for the community just from the event so here's here's some of our results just put on the map um, for hepatitis a our our upstream we saw a bit of a spike and it kind of stayed for a while our dorms there was a spike in the middle of the event and the stadium right at the end of the event, we saw a little bit of hepatitis. The airport, we had a small spike right in the middle of the event. So someone came through the airport who had hepatitis at that point. Um, the treatment plant didn't see much of a spike until the end. If you look at the influent plot, it's after the actual event that we saw a little bit of a, a gain in the concentration. And then the downstream actually had a, an, a gain also as well near the end of the event. And then our hotels, um, the one that was furthest from the event didn't see anything, that's the Valley River Inn. The residents Inn saw a little bit of a, a spike in hepatitis A, but the Hyatt Hotel actually saw the most. And, and that's actually collecting the restaurant underneath the um, hotel building as well. <laughs> another, another virus put on the map, we have SARS-CoV-2. So coronavirus was, was a little bit all over, but we definitely saw the upstream um, the surrounding community, some major spikes during the event, as well as as the dorms kind of near the end saw a major increase in, in coronavirus. The airport almost looked like it went down during the event and then bounced back afterwards. The treatment influent was, was relatively um, kind of stable. There are some ups and downs as, you, as we would expect, but it didn't see a, a large increase. And the downstream actually went down after the event. So it kind of maintained during the event. The hotels, 
Um, once again, the Hyatt saw the biggest increase during the actual track and field event. Um, the, once again, the hotel furthest from the university saw very little, a, a spike near the end. And the residence in was kind of uh, up and down, but, but the average would stay about the same. And then one more disease we can put on a map. Um, looking at flu, the upstream had a little bit of a spike near the end, um, a, a trend. The dorms actually saw more of a spike near the beginning. The airport had, had one spike in the middle there. The treatment plant, relatively stable. The downstream, kind of up and down. And here the hotels were, were not nearly as drastic up and down. It looks like the residents in may have had a little bit of a, a, an uh, influence there. But the lessons we learned from this was that high resolution spatial sampling can pinpoint some infection hotspots. And we're able to detect a single infection at the building scale. We can track the emergence and distribution of variants in community. And wastewater surveillance can be a cost effective and scalable emergency response to infectious disease outbreaks. Our challenges are we need to lower the sensitivity, might be being too sensitive. We need to shorten the turnaround times if we could get these back faster, the results faster. And standardized methods results in interpretations between labs so that everyone can communicate effectively. And we need to continue optimizing communication of results with the public and the health agencies as best as we can. And that is it. Can you hear me? Uh, so once again, for those online, if you have a question, please go ahead and chat. I'll check those after I've had a chance to run around and, and get questions answered in the room. So uh, with that, anybody want to raise their hand? Hi, guys. Thank you. Um, we know from the trace studies, we have a pretty good handle on how many uh, infected persons with COVID contribute to a certain signal in the wastewater, we have a good handle on that. We have good data from all the awesome work you guys have been doing with Trace. So I'm really curious if we have any uh, idea about what that relationship is for those other illnesses. Like when we get a log four hit on hepatitis, how many people with hepatitis are contributing to that signal to give you that number? Do we have any idea about that for the other illnesses? That is, a, yeah. COVID provided a nice database for us because the cases were so well reported. With Hep A, we don't, we, you know, we do know some medical information or OHA does and will give that to us, but I think it's not nearly as good. Um, and I don't know that we'll ever find a database as good as COVID for, for expanding our, our repertoire of pathogens. Yeah, in terms of being able to, yeah, say this correlates to number of infected per population. Hi guys, great presentation. Um, do you guys have plans to continue monitoring for things like particularly flu uh, on top of COVID coming into the fall and into future flu seasons in the same sort of micro sheds or? So right, right now we are, we're gonna do flu um, from our influence of our 43 or maybe even expand the number of cities. Um, flu from those influence from October to May, um, that which is traditional flu season, although this year it went like well into June. Um, and we also are going to do some other pathogens like RSV and uh, we'll do cryptosporidium at like a selected maybe 12 sites. So definitely expanding um, the types of pathogens we're looking at. And I think the CDC just approved proved they, that some COVID money could go towards monkeypox. And so, yeah, so definitely expanding and for sure doing COVID, I mean, flu for the next year um, during the season. Curiosity question on virus loading. Is it the same in uh, liquid human waste as solid deposits? So, so that's a great question, and we have done a study, and we're not quite analyzed yet, but what, what the Clean Water Services kind of proved initially, and we've, we're following up on that, is the virus, we think, adheres to um, like colloidal solids, 
right? And so, you know, the colloidal solids, depending on your clarifier, can go with the clar, you know, can go with the overflow, can go with the underflow, which I think is why there's been like different, like, no, it's with the liquid, no, it's with the solid. Well, it kind of is with colloidal solids. So however you do your capture. So it, it's everywhere for sure, but it does like to adhere to something, um, but it can be something pretty small. Did I answer your question? Kind of. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's with the feces. It's not, yeah, because pee is sterile. Like, unless you have a problem. <laughs> right? Well, you know, that's not something you like, you know, do a lot of talking about. So you maybe know your own self, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, that could be true. That could be true. Um, but yeah. Anyone else got a question like that? I don't know. <laughs> um, so, when a city brings you in in sort of an emergency situation and you get them their data, what are the next steps that the city usually takes with that? How do they? use that data to help their situation or does it just maybe give them a little bit more peace of mind to know what's going on? So this is a great question and an emerging question. I think the technology for you know finding these viruses and measuring them and determining their variability has come first. And the integration of public health with that information is is uh takes a little it has a longer residence time and so um we have some cities that like they want that data and i don't know they tell it to their city council every single week like silverton if we don't get it they're like where is it right <laughs> and then some cities i don't know that they ever look at it right and so i think it is an emerging um, process between public health and the folks who are collecting that data and public health has to just get used to that data what does it mean what is it significant we did like early on when there was not much testing available and the, there was still a lot of shutdowns when we went into Hermiston and it was so high and the testing numbers were so high they did do some um, you know shut it back down which I was kind of concerned I was going to get a lot of mean phone calls, but I didn't get any. <laughs> and so, um, so I think that is that is a work in progress across the country. Yeah. Probably have time for one, maybe two more. Do you notice a difference in like the quality of your sample or what you get when you uh, analyze the sample coming from? Uh, sewer shed that is primarily like residential versus a sewer shed or a city that has a significant industrial discharge, uh, uh, I guess, demographic or- you know, Yeah, so this is something that OHA is doing now. They're doing the full scale um, correlation analysis, and then we'll look at the differences in those correlations depending on the different cities. But I do know, like, for example, Astoria has a big brewery right right before their wastewater treatment plant and we did see anomalies with astoria quite a bit and that could be kind of dilution and same with clean water services every time we like michael tries to get the hospital and it's like oh hi 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 hospital nothing <laughs> right and uh, clean water services did some studies that like some of the some of the cleaning supplies used and so we all we, we often saw that also so definitely the characteristics of the sewer shed can influence the results we've actually begun isolating the hospitals when we test to to see if there's if they might be influencing things along there i've also seen um particularly right after a restaurant i can detect i can detect grease just looking at it and, I've I've told the city of Eugene actually while we were down there and um, helped them avert a disaster from a, a really terribly clogged line so we can visibly see, but it does the grease doesn't seem to affect the COVID um, concentrations. But this it might affect the sampling, yeah. like that 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 liquid went all the way over our samplers. It was 
not yeah. a pretty sight. <laughs> yeah. Right. I don't see any online questions, so maybe one more. Anybody? All right, last one. Take me back. You're gonna take me back to my PTSD. <laughs> it's not too far. Not too far. Well, okay. So the question. So. When you, the time you got COVID, I'm sorry. Yes. France Pass is where it was. Uh -huh. um, I found this slide to be the most interesting because, because they could show, I was looking at the first and the last one, they're one month apart. And did you feel that you really tracked COVID entering France Pass in this one around the 21st and then yeah. kind of see it in by the next 21st, January 21st? It seems to have spread to the entire community yeah uh the problem with this city was that we didn't get the spatial coverage we would like because a lot of the manholes were in the middle of of main highways so we had to do targeted neighborhoods um so this would suggest that right along the i-5 corridor is where it, it may have entered and then the residents that were working there caught it and then spread it to the rest of the community. But without that spatial coverage, we can't 100% certain say exactly that. This is, but it, it is suggested for future studies that that is where we would look and target the next time we go to a city. <clears throat> um, and we saw that um, in Woodburn as well. We did, I don't have the, the map, but we went out to Woodburn and right along the outlet malls um, and the, the fast food restaurants where you would stop along the I-5 corridor was where we saw the spikes three weeks in a row, actually. And we actually saw the Delta variant coming across and spread through the community is what it looked like there. So this is the Omicron variant. And it, if you look at the sequence result, it's very clear that it, like there was no Omicron yeah. <laughs> at the beginning. And then there was all Omicron at the end. It could have been another neighborhood a little bit to the left of that, to, to the west, that we didn't cover as well. Um, but it definitely that that area along the, the the highway there is where the variant seems to be coming in. Definitely. Excellent. Well, join me in thanking Michael.